One week under the belt. Everybody survive one week? At least everybody who's here survived one week. We don't know about the people who aren't here, right? If you're not here, please raise your hand. She's not here. I'm not all here, so I guess do I partial, maybe three fingers. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've had a chance to uh, start going through the problems and working the problems. Um, a lot of people don't realize I have videos of me working those problems online. So if you look on that far right column, you'll see uh, videos of me uh, actually working through some of those problems. And I hope that they are helpful to you. Um, and the TAs this week are going to be, of course, continuing more uh, work on that. They're going to be doing more Henderson Hasselbach, and they will be, uh, in fact, uh, I'm walking around, I'm not getting much feedback. That's good. Um, They'll be also doing some charge problems, so you can predict the charge of proteins of various pHs and so forth. So make sure you know how to work those. You definitely will need to know how to work those uh, later on. So hint, hint. Uh, it pays to uh, know how to do that. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, uh, last time I finished talking uh, mostly about, again, charge in henderson Hasselbach. So today I'm going to move into uh, the first of four levels of protein structure. I'll be talking about uh, what's called primary structure. I'll talk about that today. And uh, also probably talk about secondary structure, which is a second type of protein structure. When we look at proteins, uh, we see we can look at their structure at four different levels. Okay? Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. So there's four different levels of protein structure. And so we're going to talk about them individually. They each represent different things. And they each, uh, I guess together in sum, uh, give the uh, overall properties um, and structure of a protein. So in order to know protein structure, we really have to know something about all four levels of uh, protein structure. The first level of uh, protein structure is that of primary structure. So the primary structure is very simple. It simply refers to the sequence with which amino acids are joined to each other. So a sequence would say start with a methionine, followed by a cysteine, followed by a glutamic acid. That would be a sequence of amino acids. Those amino acids would be joined by peptide bonds. And peptide bonds are the um, bonds that are used to join adjacent amino acids to each other. Okay, And uh, you see a peptide bond being formed here uh, on the screen. Okay. Here is one amino acid uh, carboxyl group. Here's another amino acid amine group. And the joining uh, of these two groups results in the formation of a peptide bond and the splitting out of water. Okay? That is a reversible uh, reaction. And in fact, uh, the reaction can go backwards to the left. We can make it, we can make a peptide bond be broken. They're reasonably stable. Okay? They're reasonably stable. Uh, if we want the reaction to go backwards, we usually have to put them in acid and uh, heat them uh, a decent amount. But that will, in fact, drive the reaction backwards to breaking them. So if we wanted to break all of the peptide bonds in a protein, we would put that protein in acid and heat it up. Well, we're more interested in making bonds than we are in breaking bonds. And making of peptide bonds occurs in cells almost exclusively in the ribosomes. We'll talk about how proteins are made next term, not this term. Uh, but suffice it to say that amino acids are joined to each other via peptide bonds. The sequence of those amino acids is essential. Okay? Every property of a protein, underline that, every property of a protein ultimately arises from that sequence of amino acids. If I change the sequence of amino acids, I very likely may change the activity and properties of that protein. Okay? So if I mutate the coding region for that protein, I might change the sequence of amino acids for that protein. I might very much change the properties of that protein. So the bottom line is that primary sequence is absolutely essential for every other property. If I change the primary sequence, I, will change the, I, I may change the secondary structure, I may change the tertiary structure, and I may change the quaternary structure, at least slightly for all of those. In some cases, the changes may be very drastic, even for a simple change of primary structure. Okay? So 
That bottom line is that the primary structure governs everything else. It's for that reason why mutation is such uh, of such importance. When I mutate things, I may change that sequence. And if I change that sequence of amino acids, you can imagine I've got problems. Or I might have something that's even better. Sometimes that happens. This figure, uh, which is a rather stupid one in my opinion, but it's, it's here to illustrate for you a representation of the sequence of a polypeptide. We use the term polypeptide to refer to a polymer of amino acids. And you say, well, what's the difference between a polypeptide and a protein? And uh, there is a technical definition. People use the term protein to mean a folded active thing, whereas they use polypeptide to refer to something that's not folded, etc. I use these terms interchangeably, and in this course, we will use the terms interchangeably. So if I say protein, you may uh, substitute in your head polypeptide. I'm not going to ask you to distinguish between the two. It's not really essential for our purposes. So here's a polypeptide. It's also a, a small protein. Okay? This guy has, um, on the left side, at what's called a free amino end. <clears throat> so every protein, every polypeptide, has a free alpha amino end, and it has a free alpha carboxyl end. What does that mean? It means that at the left side of this guy right here, you see this alpha amino group, and this alpha amino group has not been joined to, a, to an alpha carboxyl group. There's no peptide bond here. No surprise. We started with this one when we made this guy. So we have a free alpha amino. This end of the protein is the alpha, uh, I'm sorry, is, is the uh, amino end of the protein. The other end, there's the alpha carboxyl. It is not. Uh, joined to anything. And so it's a free alpha carboxyl. That makes this end of the protein the carboxyl side of it. Now, if you look in the middle, every other one, there was an alpha carboxyl joined to an alpha amine. Every other one are linked up in peptide bonds. One there, one there, one there, one there. Okay. So the only places where we have a free alpha amino and a free alpha carboxyl are on the ends of the protein. All right. Well, that's not just one more thing to know. It actually simplifies your life. Because let's think about when we just finished talking about how we calculated the charge of an amino acid. We had to take into consideration not only the alpha amino, but the alpha carboxyl and the R group. Right? We had to take all three of those into consideration. Now you say, wow, we've got to calculate the charge of this whole polypeptide. How am I going to do that? All right. There's an awful lot of things there to calculate. Well, every time you have a peptide bond, the alpha amino and the alpha carboxyl no longer ionize. So it actually simplifies the calculation of charge a lot. If I were to want to calculate or estimate the charge of this polypeptide, it would be relatively simple. I would have to take into consideration three things. First, the alpha amino. Is it, does it have a proton on or proton off? And we would decide this, of course, with pKa and pH, just like we do with a regular amino acid. The alpha carboxyl, is the proton on or off? We would make that decision, just like we would for a regular amino acid. And any of the individual R groups. Well, it turns out that in this case, none of these R groups even ionize. So the calculation of charge of this guy would be very simple. Once I knew the charge of this guy and I knew the charge of this guy, that's the charge of the whole thing. All of the other alpha aminos and alpha carboxyls don't enter into the picture because putting them together in a peptide bond essentially stops them from ionizing. So that's a great simplification. Another thing that we see here, and this is why this is a kind of a stupid figure, is that if we draw this out, we see that the R groups orient themselves in opposite fashion to each other. Here's one going up. The very next one, which is on a glycine, is going down. The very next one, which unfortunately is also on a glycine, is going up down, up. So we see that the orientation of the R groups is opposite every other one with respect to the other one. Right? Why do you suppose they arrange themselves that way? Steric hindrance. Very good. Okay. So we've got steric hindrance. These guys have more space to flex out if they're on opposite sides of each other as we see here. 
When we have a really big R group, this can affect things like tryptophan or something like that. This can really affect how the space uh, around this is all uh, there. And we'll see an example of that in just a little bit. Questions about this? OK. Pretty straightforward. Let's move forward. Here's a schematic that tries to show you better what the last one was aimed at showing you. There's one R group, second R group, third R group, fourth R group, fifth R group. Very simple. Okay. Now, another thing we take into consideration with respect to proteins is that peptide bonds have a dual character about them. The way it was written before, we saw the peptide bond as a single bond. And there's that bond between that carbon and that nitrogen. And you see there's only a single bond right there. You'll notice there's a double bond to the oxygen, which means that there's electrons there for that oxygen, uh, in that bond to that oxygen, that actually can be swapped around. And that's what we see going on over here. There's resonance. That is, these two structures are electronically equivalent to each other. They're electronically equivalent to each other. Now, we're not going to get into the biophysics of the electronics. That's not the important thing. There's something much simpler that is at stake and important. The simpler thing is, a good deal of the time, this guy acts like a double bond. It acts like a double bond, in fact, so much that we essentially treat it as if it is a double bond. Now, what significance does that have for us relative to uh, their overall protein structure. Well, it's a very big thing. The big thing is if we have a single bond, you remember from organic chemistry, I hope, that you can rotate around single bonds. We can twist, we can turn, we have a lot more flexibility as a result of that twisting and turning. Okay? When we have a double bond, remember that's how we get cis-trans, right? We start seeing things we can't twist. They get fixed in space, one side versus the other side. Okay? A double bond cannot be twisted. That means, therefore, that when we have peptide bonds, we've essentially got something that is flat and unchanging. Okay? Here is a representation of a double bond. Okay? That double bond exists as a plane because it's flat. We could actually look at this and we could say, well, here's the four points right here. We have uh, the double bond that's in the middle. We have a an oxygen coming down here. We have a carbon back up over here. Off of the nitrogen, we have a hydrogen up here and a carbon down here. This represents that peptide bond if it's a double bond. Okay. That's a very important parameter because as we're going to see, every peptide bond in a protein can be thought of as a plane, a flat structure. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, that's uh, an important consideration because proteins don't just have one peptide bond. They're loaded with peptide bonds. Okay? Here's a representation now of a protein. There's the peptide bond, and this guy is going to act very much like it's a double bond. However, that's only one bond in this protein. There's two other bonds in the backbone of the protein that we think about. When I say backbone, Hopefully you know I'm talking about the alpha amino, the alpha carboxyl, and the alpha carbon. That's what makes the backbone of a protein. There you see the alpha amino, the alpha carboxyl, and the alpha carbon. Same thing here, alpha carbon, alpha amino, alpha carboxyl. That's all that the backbone of a protein consists of. One in three of those bonds acts like a double bond. One in three. Okay. Well, that sets up an interesting situation. Okay. And I don't know if you guys have ever taken the Mensa test where you have to do these sort of mental gymnastics, picturing things in your head. So I'm going to try to minimize this as much as I can. Uh, I don't do that sort of stuff myself either. But um, I want you to uh, be thinking about how we might orient things. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to come back to the cis and trans uh, in a minute. Here's a representation now, not of the, of the peptide bond. The peptide bonds are, here's one peptide bond, I'm sorry, one peptide bond over here between this carbon and this nitrogen. And here's another peptide bond over here between this carbon and nitrogen. Okay? 
Between it, we have two single bonds. So between every pair of peptide bonds, we have two single bonds. And what you remember from organic chemistry is that single bonds can rotate. Here's one peptide bond over here. Here's one peptide bond over here. And between these two peptide bonds, there are single bonds. What does that mean if they can rotate? It means that the entire plane of the peptide bond can rotate. Okay? The peptide bond itself it can't, can't twist and turn. But the bonds between the peptide bonds can twist and turn. Okay. Now what we're starting to learn here is something about very important about protein structure. Protein structure is amazingly complex. The more we can simplify protein structure, the better off we are. And so what I'm trying to give you here is a simplification. One peptide bond, the other peptide bond, two single bonds in the middle. We can imagine my nose is the alpha carbon. Okay? So I've got the alpha carbon, I've got a bond to this guy, I've got a bond to this guy. Everybody got that? The bonds between them are rotatable. So this whole plane rotates as it is. And what we discover is that it turns out my nose isn't a very good estimate because these guys are much closer like this. Now do we start to see some problems with steric hindrance? We could imagine that if we start rotating, there's going to be some places where these guys are going to bump into each other. They're not going to be very favorable for structure. They're structurally unstable. Okay? So I'm going to have some places uh, where these bonds try to rotate, they're going to come crashing into each, to each other. And of course, we know they won't come crashing into each other because van der Waals forces will preclude that from happening. They're going to avoid certain rotational angles because it's just not possible for them to fit together. Those rotational angles have names, and they're actually shown on this slide. They're known as the phi, which is the one shown on the left, and the psi, rotational angles. Those are rotational angles around the alpha carbon. Phi and psi are rotational angles around the alpha carbon. Yes? I'm sorry, were those the angles that they avoid going into? Or they're po all possible angles. Okay? Okay. So we'll see that there are certain angles, certain values of phi and psi that work, and certain values of phi and psi that don't work. But phi and psi are just theoretical angles, are all they are. OK, so I'm going to repeat that. That's an important concept. Phi and psi are rotational, underline that word, rotational angles around the alpha carbon. And what's being rotated are the planes of the peptide bond. Now, I've just told you that there are some angles that are unstable. You can imagine things don't fit together very well. Okay? What we discover, there's a man named Ramachandran who recognized this long ago. And Ramachandran got a computer out. He knows the molecular dimensions. He knows how far, how far apart the bonds are. He knows the size of the nuclei and so forth. And he says, well, I could predict places where we're going to have stability, something like this, versus instability, something like this. And so he does a plot. The plot it was named after him. It's known as a Ramachandran plot. The Ramachandran plot plots all possible values of phi against all possible values of psi. So we see 360 degrees okay, on, the, on the y-axis, which is psi, going from, minus from plus 180 down to minus 180. That's 360 degrees. And the same thing for phi on the x-axis from minus 180 to plus 180. So he told the computer, try all possible angles. And you can calculate the energies associated with these by how close things get. They get too close. You're going to make a structure that's not very stable. What he discovered was that there were three areas of stability. They're shown in green. Light green being less stable, dark green being more stable. See a very light, light green out here. Now, what a Ramachandran plot tells us is a theoretical plotting of stability of angles of phi and psi. A theoretical. This was done completely with a computer. 
The question arises then, well, how good does theory stand up to actual fact? I hope that by the time I talk about secondary structure, I convince you that the theory was pretty darn good. And we actually use the theory to help us to predict structures of proteins. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to say more about Ramachandra when I talk about secondary structure in a few minutes. Okay, questions about this for, before I do that? Yeah. Very good question. Does it depend upon which amino acids? And the answer is yes, it does. So there are some considerations that go into making a plot like this. And you could imagine that some very bulky amino acids might have some very different kind of Ramachandran plots than those that are not. And you're, you're exactly right. Yes? So the dark green are the areas that are favored. Stablest. Uh huh. Yep. So let's say minus 120, minus 120. So let's say we're right here, for example. Minus 120, minus 120. That would not be stable. But minus 60 and minus 120 would be about right there. And yes, it would be. Exactly. So you can line up and look at this and, and determine where the regions of stability are located. Make sense? OK, good, good. All right. So don't let this fluster you. The aim of this is to get you to understand something about protein structure. Well, what I hope you will take away from this is with this I've given you a simplification of protein structure. Because we can think of a way of describing the structure of a protein simply by describing all the phi psi angles for every single alpha carbon in that protein. Here's phi psi angles for the first one. Here's phi psi angles for the second one. Here's phi psi for the third. And we start getting a simplification now in terms of that overall structure. It's indeed theoretically possible to do that. OK? OK. Now, let's uh, take a look at how the groups orient themselves with respect to each other. OK? This shows orientation of R groups in the trans configuration. Okay? R groups in the trans configuration. That was, in fact, the way I drew them for you originally. There's nothing, however, that says they have to be that way. They don't have to be that way. Why? Because there are single bonds that are capable of rotating. And when they rotate, we can get some groups now that are bumping into each other. I'm sorry, this, these are the R groups here, these two here. Okay. But it doesn't matter for our purposes. These two groups start bumping into each other, we put them in the cis configuration. Steric hindrance, we're going to see problems. We don't imagine that's going to be very stable. And in fact, what we see when we look at proteins is that for virtually every amino acid, 99.99% .99 of the time, they orient themselves in the trans orientation. Steric hindrance being the primary reason. There's only one amino acid that even has a chance of appearing in the cis configuration, and it's proline. Proline appears in the cis configuration about one time in 100. Once in 100. Okay? Why do you suppose proline does that? It has that inflexible ring. That inflexible ring causes some, it to have some chemical properties that other um, uh, amino acids don't have. And proline has less flexibility. We're going to talk about that more. Of all the amino acids, the least flexible is proline. Because the others just have that R group hanging off of a single bond. It can rotate, it can twist, it can do its thing. In the case of proline, that R group hanging off is linked back like this. So now we can imagine that it doesn't have that flexibility that the other ones have. And as a consequence, there are some, there's some different chemistry that happens with proline. OK, we'll talk more about that in a bit. OK, questions on uh, what I've had to say about primary structure? OK, let's talk about secondary structure. So we've talked about the most basic level of protein structure, the sequence of amino acids, and the fact that peptide bonds comprise that sequence. And peptide bonds are, in fact, the joining things for all of proteins. Now we're going to talk about secondary structure. What we see with secondary structure, I'm going to define it first. 
and then we'll go through some examples. Secondary structure refers to regular interactions. By regular, you can think of repeating if you would like. Regular interactions between amino acids that are close together in primary sequence. Interactions, regular interactions between amino acids that are close in primary sequence. What does that mean? Okay. What it means from a practical point of view is that we're looking at interactions between amino acids that are less than 10 amino acids apart. The most common is about six or seven amino acids apart. These interactions largely are in the form of hydrogen bonds. Largely. What you see on the screen is one of these regular repeating sets of structures, or the sets of interactions. Okay? The structure arises from the interactions. This is a structure we commonly see in proteins called an alpha helix. The alpha helix was discovered by Linus Pauling back in the late 1940s. It arose again from prediction by Linus Pauling. So theory gave rise to what we actually know is the case for, for alpha helices. Okay. And an alpha helix doesn't just happen to form. It forms because there's stability in its formation. The stability arises from the hydrogen bonds that form between these nearby amino acids. So for example, I might have hydrogen bond between this guy right here and this guy down here, this guy right here and this guy down here, et cetera. We can imagine a series of hydrogen bonds that are going to stabilize that structure. If we don't have anything stabilizing the structure, we will not have an alpha helix. Similarly, if we have something destabilizing the structure, we're not going to have an alpha helix either. Okay. Now. I'm going to show you a, another view of the alpha helix here in just a second. There's a, an attempt to show you some of the hydrogen bonds. I think it's kind of a confusing figure. But you can see uh, some of the hydrogen bonds uh, occurring between some of the amino acids there. This is a view of the alpha helix looking right down the middle of it, looking at it end on. And what we see is something interesting. Those green guys there are all R groups. Alpha helices point the R groups outside of the helix. They point the R groups outside of the helix. So in an alpha helix, the R groups are pointed outwards. Again, why do you suppose? Steric hindrance. You betcha. Even with this orientation, you could imagine that some of these groups, if they're really big, might cause problems, right? Those would be destabilizing factors for an alpha helix. And when we destabilize the alpha helix, it's not going to form. We could think, yeah, there probably are some amino acids that are bulky enough. If I try to put it next to another one, it's not going to fit very well. And it's going to destabilize the alpha helix. That's, in fact, exactly what happens. Okay, Tryptophan, for example, great big bulky group. You recognize it's probably not going to be a real stabilizing amino acid in an alpha helix. It's probably going to be destabilizing. Proline's another one. Proline, because it's not flexible, okay, doesn't allow the twisting as much as the other ones allow. We don't see proline appearing in alpha helices very commonly. So these two things affect whether something will be in an alpha helix or not be in an alpha helix. There's a space filling model of the same thing. OK, does that make sense? OK. Here are, uh, here's a representation of some of the hydrogen bonds that are occurring between individual amino acids within there. Okay, We can see this uh, carbonyl to this hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. 
I said six before. It's more like about four between, between them. But the, the important thing is that we have the hydrogen bonds that stabilize this structure. And we don't have other things in the middle that are destabilizing that structure. Well, now you start to get an idea about, well, maybe then there, we can predict if something will be in an alpha helix or not if we have the sequence of amino acids. Okay? And the answer is we can do a pretty good job of predicting whether or not a given sequence of amino acids will form an alpha helix. We're pretty good at predicting that. Because we know the size of the R groups, it's kind of like a Ramachandran plot, we can figure out all the things that we need to with that. And in fact, we can do a pretty good job of making that prediction. OK. Now, uh, Ramachandran, if we take the same information to Ramachandran, and we say, here's what we know about an alpha helix. Here are the actual angles of an alpha helix. Look where the angles of the alpha helix appear on a Ramachandran plot. Right in the predicted areas of stability. One of them in the most predicted areas of stability. And in fact, this one is the one you almost always see. You almost never see this. So the prediction that happen as a result of a computer analysis give rise to what we actually know about the structure today of the, the alpha helix. So this tells us, first of all, that an alpha helix is a very stable region in a Ramachandran plot. One of the reasons that we see alpha helices is because we have this stability. We have these forces that help to hold it together. Questions on that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so that's a good question. So a helix, it turns out, helices can actually form in two ways. We'll talk about this later with respect to DNA. But it's kind of hard to show here. But they can coil one way, or they can coil the other way. And if, you're, if you find that puzzling, don't get too worried about that. But if you come to my office, I'll show you a telephone cord and explain to you um, how uh, a helix can form. Telephone cords, that's the things that used to connect the phone to the other end. <laughs> Just in case you haven't heard that. So maybe it's new technology for you or something. Very high tech. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Does this necessarily mean that um, for secondary structure that a lot of the sequences are going to be not kind of recycled because they, they kind of have to be in order to assume a secondary structure? OK, so her question is, does this mean that we're going to see recycle or recycling of secondary structures between different proteins? I think that was sort of your question. Of sequences. of sequences and that. It's a very good question. Um, the answer to that question is we see recycling of mostly of structure and not so much of sequence. If we have two related proteins, like let's say a DNA polymerase from me and a DNA polymerase from a dog, they're very related, and you'll see conservation of amino acid sequence just because of evolutionary relationships. However, if you were to say, well, let's take a look at all of the alpha helices, you would discover that there's an amazing diversity of sequences that will, in fact, give rise to an alpha helix. So, but it's a very, very good question. Um, yeah. OK, so that's what's up with an alpha helix. Yes, question. Yeah, Julie. Uh -huh. or what about ones that can form dipole bonds? Okay, so what about ones that can form dipole bonds? Dipoles um, are, trans uh, are important in transient uh, st uh, structural stability of, um, of um, polypeptide chains, but they're not a primary thing uh, other than the, uh, dipoles can be induced, for example. And so that can, on a, on a momentary basis, change the, 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 the sort of flexibility structure of a protein, but they're not a, a stabilizing factor overall. But they won't affect like, the helix. They will not affect the helix. Hydrogen bonds really are the determining, what, the, probably the most important stabilizing factor of secondary structure. And I should also point out, and Julie's question is a good one, because there are many, many forces that help to stabilize the overall protein structure. Okay, Many, many forces that helped stabilize the overall protein structure. But for short range things like we're talking about here, for the most part, we're talking about hydrogen bonds. OK? OK. So um, let's turn our attention now to 
Um, oh, here's a, here's a, okay, so here's a schematic representation. You're going to see a lot of these this term. I'm not a big um, person on sort of using structure for the sake of structure. Your book tends to be very fond of this, as do a lot of people. But all this is aimed at showing you is that some proteins have only alpha helical regions. Now, I show you this. This is a protein called ferritin. The only secondary structure it has is um, alpha helix. But you'll notice that this secondary structure does not go like we might imagine a DNA helix does. We think of DNA as going on and on and on and on and on. It's a double helix, right? This guy bends, OK? These bends, OK, really are essential for the overall structure of this protein. These bends we're going to see come about as a result of tertiary structure. I'm not quite a tertiary structure yet, but that's what's coming. So the overall three-dimensional perspective of this protein is if I know only the secondary structure, I won't know the overall structure because I don't know where the bends and all that stuff is. OK. So let's turn our attention now to another secondary structure. And this other secondary structure um, is called a beta strand. A beta strand. So we talked about an alpha helix. Now we're going to talk about a different kind of structure called a beta strand. The representations excuse me, that are there are not real good. Here's um, a better one. Okay? What we see on the screen are two separate beta strands. One on the top, one on the bottom. And in fact, when you look at this, this looks very much like that representation I drew for you for primary structure, right? Look at the R groups, up, down, up, down, up, down, alternating. Okay? At the simplest level of structure of a protein, we have the beta strand. A beta strand is actually simpler than an alpha helix. An alpha helix coils, right? We can imagine if we take that coil and we flatten it out so that instead of coiling and making a circle, we actually make bends down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. That's what a beta strand has. A beta strand has only bends. It has no coil. We can think of a beta strand as being a flat surface. Okay? So just like I could take this guy right here and fold it, alternating like so, you get an idea what a beta strand actually looks like. Okay. So the folds, we talk about the, the beta strands as behaving like a pleated sheet. Now, one of the confusions is that books aren't very good about being consistent about describing beta strands and the sum of them called a beta sheet. Okay. So what this is, we see one beta strand on the top, and it is hydrogen bonded to another beta strand on the bottom. And the spacing of these guys is such that, wow, the hydrogen bonds fit up very nicely. We could imagine this would be a very stabilized structure. If we put another beta strand down here, you start to see the sheet. We start to see the sheet. Okay. So a, a beta sheet is comprised of multiple beta strands. We start putting them together. We make a beta sheet, not a beta strand. But at the simplest level, we have a beta strand. Does that make sense? Yes? Good question. So in this case, they, they can actually be on separate strands, or they might loop back around over here and be attached in peptide bonds. So there, there's no rule as such. OK. OK. Yes? Is the beta strand or the beta sheet more stable than an alpha helix? The answer is no. The stability of any structure is going to depend upon the amino acids comprising it. So there are going to be certain amino acid sequences that are going to favor beta strands, and certain amino acid sequences that are going to favor alpha helices, and a third set that's not going to favor either one. OK? So for a given sequence, one or, or versus the other will be favored. OK? OK. Now, let's go back here. And 
look at now the Ramachandran plot. Look where beta strands appear. Okay? Right there in the most predicted region of stability. And what you see plotted in red is the place where all of the beta strands are found. That's the wide range that's there, and they all fit in the stablest region of the theoretical plotting on a Ramachandran plot. Theory is good. Okay? The theory was good. It told us a lot about protein structure. Now, I've got a question for you. The question is as follows. Occasionally, we will come up with a protein, and we will look and we'll measure the angles on the Ramachandran plot, and we will discover something that's slightly outside of the stable region. What does that mean? Was the theory wrong? We usually don't see it very far out, but we see it close, but not quite where the, in the stable region. What's that? It's an outlier, he says, and to some extent that's true, but I'm looking for a better answer, actually. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's in between folding. Actually, no, that's not. It's a good, nice, nice guess. But it's not really that because when we determine structures, they're actually a fixed thing at that point. They're crystals. So we actually know that they're not in between anything. But nice try. How might that happen? Yeah. Because in alpha helix, it's more, I guess, precise because it's tightly coiled, whereas a beta strand is like not coiled. They're a lot simpler and a lot more laid out. Okay, so no, it, it has nothing to do with the coiling, actually. So that, that's not quite it either. What does this tell you? Okay, what did, I, what did I describe these regions as? Regions of stability, right? So why was this region more stable than this region? Steric hindrance. So notice I said we didn't get very far out of here. So outlier, as he said, was part of the reason that that's the case. But there has to be something else that allows that to happen. Okay, so he says R groups may affect this, and that's another very good point. And there's yet one more. Robert? Proline. Well, proline sometimes has that happen. But again, I'm looking for something else. Do the R groups react with each other? No, the R don't react with each other. Yeah. Resonance? Resonance, uh, sort of, not quite. Yep. Okay, so he's, sort of, he's on the right track. So he says a little bit of instability in one region might lead to more stability in another. Basically what I'm talking about is strain. Okay? If you look at your elbow, it really isn't designed to go way up like this. But if somebody grabs it and pulls it there, you'll feel pain and it will go there. Okay? A protein that has other regions that have stabilized things may have enough stability to hold that strain in place and keep it from uh, going where it doesn't want to go. So we might see a protein having regions of tension arising from other regions that really stabilize things. So he's very much on the right track with his answer there. OK. So we would expect if we saw things outside of these theoretical regions, we probably have some kind of strain or something else going on with those sequences. And what we see is amazing. We have, we have the, the structure now of over 30,000 proteins. Okay? There's a lot of data that's out there. And they don't get very far from these theoretical regions. So, okay. Let's see, what do we got here time-wise? All right. The, um, this is just another depiction of different ones. These guys can be oriented. Uh, you may not have noticed these arrows, okay? This is showing from amino to carboxyl going left to right, amino to carboxyl. These are what are called parallel. It's not a big deal, but I just show it to you so because your book mentions it. And the one I showed you before was anti-parallel, and that was right here. Notice the arrows are going in opposite orientations. Not a big deal. Anti-parallel is what we think of the strands in DNA, because they are oriented oppositely. But, we, but the bottom line is we, we can see stable uh, parallel and anti-parallel beta strands in a beta sheet. OK. Uh, let's see. You guys up for a joke? OK, I've got my duck joke for you. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the Oregon football team. Okay. All right, so these, these three guys, they die and they go to heaven. Okay. 
if you've heard this joke, please don't give it away. So they die and they go up to heaven. Okay, and they get up to heaven, and um, they get there and they look around. And they see these ducks walking around everywhere. Okay, and Saint Peter at the pearly gates says, "Okay, welcome. We're happy to have you here. But whatever you do, you don't step on a duck." What the hell? This is heaven, right? I can do anything I want to. I was good, right? Okay. No stepping on ducks. So they go, okay, we're not going to step on a duck. Well, they go walking around. They're having a good time. And sure enough, one of them steps on a duck, right? And the sirens go off. And this police come down out of the skies, which they're already in heaven, which is kind of a weird thing. But the police come down. <laughs> they grab him. And they've got this mean, old, ugly woman. And they said, you step on a duck. They grab him. And they chain him to this woman. And they say, you're going to spend eternity chained to this woman for stepping on a duck. Wow, this wasn't what I thought heaven was all about. The other two guys are pretty careful now. Okay, they're serious. Got to be very careful. I'm not going to step on duck, right? Very tiptoeing around, tiptoeing around. Well, they get tiptoeing around more and more, and one of them, after about a month, accidentally steps on a duck. Same thing happens, only it's worse. The police come down. The sirens are going off. They get this bigger, meaner, uglier woman, and she's got a frying pan in her hand. They chain this woman, and he starts, she starts beating him on the head with a frying pan. They say, you're going to spend eternity chained to this woman. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't handle this. I just can't handle this. So the last guy, he is paranoid. I mean, he doesn't want to move, right? He doesn't want, he doesn't want to step. He doesn't want to take any chance. He doesn't want to fall. He doesn't want to do anything. He just doesn't want to be. I mean, this isn't what he envisioned at all. He's very careful. A whole year goes by, and he has not stepped on a duck. And then the sirens go off. Ah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Did. And the police come down, and they got this beautiful, gorgeous, voluptuous woman. And they chain him to him. And he looks at her, and he says, this wasn't what I expected. And she says, it's what, you get for what I get for stepping on a duck. <laughs> okay. That's good. That didn't take quite as long as that does. I'm going to say one more thing and then I will shut up. Okay. There is one other consideration with secondary structure. There are things, as I said, that favor not being in a secondary structure. That is, they destabilize secondary structures. They destabilize beta strands. They destabilize alpha helices. And you want, you, you're going to want to make these rules very simple. You're going to want to say, oh, tryptophan is going to destabilize those. Well, you'll find examples where tryptophan is in an alpha helix and where tryptophan is in a beta strand. But you may not see it happen very often. Why do you suppose that might be the case? It depends what it's next to, right? So some amino acids next to tryptophan may be OK. Others may not be OK. So it's not the individual amino acid, but the sequence of amino acids that's important. And some, like proline, are really going to be hard because they're going to bend. Proline will literally bend the uh, uh, structure of the, the polypeptide. And as a result of that, we make something called turns. So if we have something that destabilizes the structure of, a, of the secondary structure of a protein, we create what's called a turn. And the turn is very much like what I showed you in ferritin. In that structure where you saw the alpha helix, and then a turn, and then another alpha helix, and then a turn, those turns are coming about over a relatively short stretch of amino acids, about four long, like this, okay? where the turn actually itself is stabilized, again, by hydrogen bonds. So what we've seen is alpha helix, beta strands. Beta strands can come together in beta sheets. And things that destabilize those lead to turns. OK? That's enough for today. We'll finish uh, one more aspect of secondary structure next time. Yeah. When we find proteins that are not very far off from the channel, but how do they characterize that to find out the angles, like crystallography? Or? Crystallography, yep. NMR and crystallography, the two primary ways. They're on the website. On the yeah, website. Go, go to that first page. You'll see they're listed there. Okay, thank okay? you. Sure. I just got them up this weekend. So. Right. 
Hi, how you doing? How's it going? Oh, just a second. Yeah. How you doing, Katie? What's up? Good. Um, I just have a question. Um, one of the homework problems for Chapter 2 uh -huh. talks about, like, hair and, like, its yep. um, structure and, like, what, like, creates, like, curls. Yep. Does it have to do with, like, um, so, the structure being, like, hydrophobic or, or, like, if it was, like, reversed and then, like... Actually, the, the, the primary factor in curls are disulfide bonds between cystins. Yeah, I'm going to say a little bit about that. I didn't get to that today, but when I talk about fibrous proteins next time, your hair is a fibrous protein, mm -hmm. and the, the the curls literally come from, from uh, cysteine bonds. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I, just, I guess I was a little confused. So have you ever had a permanent? And you um, go, have you ever had a permanent? No, my hair is actually naturally really curly. Yeah, yeah. Straight it. <laughs> uh, so uh, people who have permanents, okay, go to the... Go, go to get their hair done and they discover it stinks like crazy uh -huh. and they have to use a chemical that breaks disulfide bonds that's why okay so yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that next time okay. take care Katie thanks hey guy how's it going good how are you good